Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one is called Rexism and Catholic Action and is the last but one chapter, chapter 11, in the book Behind the Dictators from Herbert Leo Lehman, written in 1942. So we're almost through the book and here comes the last but one chapter, Rexism and Catholic Action. Nowhere has Catholic action shown itself more in line with Nazi fascism than in Belgium, where Leon de Grel's Rexist party in 1940 came into its own. Now, on Leon de Grel, I am going to make you a little note here that you know who he is. After the Second World War was over, de Grel took refuge in Frankwest, Spain. He was convicted of treason in absentia, means in absence, in Belgium, and sentenced to death, but repeated requests to extradite him were turned down by the Spanish government. Stripped of his citizenship and excommunicated, which the excommunication was later lifted in Germany, de Grel died in Malaga in Spain in 1994. Another example of how the Roman Catholic Church protects its fascist leaders from persecution, because such was Leo de Grel. If you still want to learn more on the Rexit Party, as is laid out here, you can read these Wikipedia pages that I will provide in the description box of the video, but notice that Wikipedia is always to be taken carefully, and you have to read that with a little bit of salt when you understand what I mean. It is an open source, so not everything is quite correct, and surely not when you measure it to the Bible, the Word of God, the real and only truth that we know. But continue, Pope Pius XI gave the Jesuit slogan Christus Rex, which means Christ the King, to Catholic action as the battle cry for its crusade over Catholic reconstruction of the social order. This slogan, Christus Rex, is from the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. The same cry, Viva Cristo Rey, was used by Franco's fascists in their war against the legitimate republican government of Spain. It was the war cry of the fanatic Mexican Indians who were spurred on by the Jesuits to commit acts of sabotage against the Republican government of Mexico. It was also the cry of the Spanish rebel officers who, with the help of the Moorish troops, tortured, violated and slaughtered nearly 15,000 men, women and children alike at Badajoz. The Rexists in Belgium claimed the honor of being the first fruits of Catholic action, the quote-unquote Christian frontas of Belgium. Their leader, de Leon de Grel, the Belgian peasants nicknamed him Adolf de Grel, was won over to the movement by the Monsignor Picard when he was a student at the University of Louvain. He and all his assistants are products of Jesuit training. And we can read that in R. A. Dior, in his book Le Vatican, in Paris, 1937, published on page 42, quote, Leon de Grel is a, pup, is a pupil of these gentlemen, i.e. the Jesuits, so also are all his colleagues, unquote. He became the great lay apostle of Catholic action in the Jesuit drive to align the Catholic Church with Nazi fascist plans for the new order in Europe after the destruction of liberalism and democracy. As the scope of de Grel's activities increased, his Christ the King movement was temporarily separated from Catholic action in Belgium with the consent of the hierarchy. This maneuver was designed to give the Rexists greater liberty of action to work out Nazi fascist policies. This I call another example of the Jesuit tactic blown cover as cover. Thereupon, the apparently independent Rex is, uh, Rexist popular front was set up ostensibly to fight Jewish communism 
much on the same lines as Father Coughlin's Christian Front in America. Now, Jewish Communism. When communism is actually an invention of the Jesuits, as you can see by studying the reductions of Paraguay in the 17th century. But again, of course, blaming and putting Jews in the front for all to see. When everybody learns that communism is Jewish and communism is not good for individual prosperity, then of course the Jews are to blame. And nobody suspects the Jesuits behind it who actually started communism. For that, just Google reductions of Paraguay and see what the Jesuits did there in the 16th and 17th century. And you will learn how communism actually came to life. Now, de Grel's chief officer was the white Russian Denisov, who was secretary to the last president of the council in the Tsarist regime. Today, de Grel is Hitler's right-hand man in Nazi-occupied Belgium, where no signs of disagreement are apparent between the Catholic hierarchy and the Nazi invaders. In their, point, uh, in, uh, sorry, in their joint pastoral letter of October 1940, the Catholic bishops of Belgium instructed their people as follows, quote, It is doubtless necessary to recognize the occupying power as a de facto power and to obey it within the limits of international conventions, unquote. And this quote comes from the Jesuit magazine America, on the 22nd of February 1941, out of the horse's mouth itself. He has organized his own stormtroopers, formation of uh, formation de combat, he calls them, formations of combat, and is fast bringing Belgium into close collaboration with Hitler's new order. In a heavily censored dispatch from Liège to the New York Times on January 6, 1941, de Grel said, quote, We must make our choice now. We have faith in the Führer as the greatest man of our times. Trust his spirit, his genius, and have faith in the Europe which he will build up. The youth of all Europe is today fighting shoulder to shoulder for a new order under German leadership. German weapons will win because they are defending a just cause. Hitler saved Europe and Belgium's future could, several words missing here in the telegram, cooperation with the Reich. So probably and Belgium's future could, secure, uh, by, could be secured by cooperation with the Reich, the Third Reich, that probably means. End of the quote. Now, <clears throat> as I just read to you, the youth of all Europe is today fighting shoulder to shoulder for a new order under German leadership, de Grel stated in this sense of dispatch from Liège to the New York Times. Now, remind you the words of Pope Leo XIII to the German Emperor in 1917, as quoted in Chapter 4 of this book. Quote, it was of interest to me, says the German, uh, says the uh, German Kaiser, that, uh, that the Pope said to me on this occasion that Germany must become the sword of the Catholic Church. I remarked that the old Roman Empire of the German nation no longer existed and that conditions had changed. But he, Pope Leo XIII, stuck to his words. So, when this was told the German Kaiser in 1917, de Grel puts this up, picks this up, during the Second World War by saying the youth of all Europe is today fighting shoulder to shoulder for a new order under German leadership. Now, let me ask you a question. 2016, today, who is actually the strongest country within the European Union, the revived Holy Roman Empire of Europe? Huh? Economically, politically, who is the strongest one? Germany, eh?
So what they didn't achieve in the World War, they achieved afterwards by fomenting the European common market, the UN European economic common system, later on with the introduction of the euro monetary uh, money to make Europe all the same, that everywhere in Europe you can pay with only this one currency, and this is all under German leadership. By the way, do you know where the ECB, the European Central Bank, is seated? Frankfurt, Germany. The same city that gave birth to the Rothschilds in the time when they lived in the so-called Judengasse in Frankfurt, a banking town. It is also called Mainhattan, for it is at the river Main in comparison to Manhattan. It is called Manhattan, Frankfurt. Germany leads. And this is exactly what Pope Leo XIII wanted already in 1917, when he spoke to the German Emperor and said that Germany must become the sword of the Catholic Church. Now we continue in the book. There never was any secret about de Grel's collaboration with Hitler. In its issue of May 20th, 1936, the Paris newspaper Le Temps, means the Times, called attention to the close relationship between the Rexist party and Hitler's National Socialism. And shortly before the Belgian elections in May 1936, de Grel went to Germany to study Nazi propaganda methods. After the example of the German Führer and Father Kaufmann, he sought to gather around him all the discontented elements of the middle class. In imitation of Goebbels, he carried favor with the workers by appearing to side with the strikers. The chief point of comparison, however, between Rexism and Nazi fascism is that both declared war on Catholic liberal tendencies among both the clergy and the laity with the aim of setting up the Jesuit authorita authoritarian control of Catholic activities. This was the real reason why Catholic action was instituted by Pope Pius XI. And I went already in earlier chapters on the persecution of Catholic liberal tendencies of the liberal clergy and of the liberal laity because when you read the oath of the Jesuits, and I made a video on that, so you can always look that up, the Jesuits are to go against liberals, even in their own ranks, of course, because the church has to be the gainer in the end, and liberals cannot be accepted. Now it is not out of place to repeat the underlying reasons for, his, for this desire to abolish all pre-Hitler Catholic politics throughout Europe, a thing the Jesuits for many years had ardently longed to see accomplished. As already pointed out, the old Catholic political parties had become intimately bound up with the liberal constitutions of states, wherein all parties and religions were able to coexist freely. Furthermore, the ideology of the liberal democratic state, with its principles of religious and racial tolerance, was broadening the political and social outlook of these Catholic parties. The, fraterni the fraternizing of the secular clergy with the laity in these political parties furthered the spirit of tolerance as opposed to the traditional intolerance of Catholic dogma. On the other hand, it must also be remembered that in Germany the two Catholic political parties, the Center Party and the Bavarian Popular Party, because of their close religious connections with the Roman Catholic Church, had met with strong opposition from the Protestant part of the population. As a consequence, the constituted ex uh, existence of these parties threatened to compromise the aim of Catholic action, which was to use Germany as the instrument to effect its counter-reformation designs. 
It was thus necessary for a new Catholic policy to camouflage itself as a national movement and make itself appear as the only party representing the nation as a whole. Now, I cannot but go back to the last but one sentence. As a consequence, the continued existence of these parties threatened to compromise the aim of Catholic action which was to use Germany as the instrument to effect its counter-reformation designs. Now when you think about it, isn't that kind of cruel to take Germany from which the reformation actually really took heat with Luther in 1517 nailing his 95 Thesis on the church door in Wittenberg so Germany was the cradle of the Reformation, and now they used Germany as the instrument to effect its counter-Reformation designs. You get that? Germany first is the cradle of the Reformation, and now they make it the cradle of counter-Reformation. That happens when you have the power of the Roman Catholic Church in your country. So, my dear American brothers, think about what will happen to your country that was Protestant from the beginning, hijacked in 1776 by a Catholic government all the time, and today is completely run by Jesuit trained persons. counter-reformationists. Jesuits are nothing else but counter-reformation. Every time I read the word Jesuits, you can also read counter-reformation. Means against the word of God. But okay, continue here. It can thus be seen why the abolition of the pre-Hitler Catholic political parties in Germany had the approval of the movement for Catholic reconstruction. Here is what Gonzague de Reynold has to say on the point. Quote, the center party, which Hitler fought with all his might, because they were liberals, was forced to commit suicide. But it was a party which had already shown signs of deterioration which had made many mistakes and upon which the young people were turning their backs. The news that soon <coughs> the news that soon they could take part in real Catholic action without any addition of party politics aroused great enthusiasm. Unquote. For the very same reason the Rexist party in Belgium, direct offspring of Catholic action, likewise declared quote, all Catholic parties are the result of a fixed historical situation and have advantages and disadvantages for the Church. When these historical situations cease to exist, Catholic parties lose their reason for existence. This applies equally to the Catholic party in Belgium. Up till now, differing opinions could be had as to their usefulness and their right to, uh, to existence, Today, however, they are anachronisms. I'm sorry, I butchered this word. They are anachronisms. Anachronisms. Oh, yeah. That's uh, not an easy word to read, so I'm going to repeat the sentence. Up till now, differing opinions could be had as to their usefulness and their right to existence. Today, however, they are anachronisms as were the Center Party in Germany and the Popular Party in Italy. Unquote. The Catholic Party did not understand the new historic mission. The confessional movement did not transform itself into a national movement. Because of these deficiencies, it had to disappear like all other parties. The Rexis Party will now take up the defense of Catholic and ecclesiastical interests. It does not only intend to defend the Church, but also to take the whole religious question out of politics. It will effect this by means of the constitutional guarantee of the rights of the Catholic Church and by drawing up a concordat to regulate the relations between the State and 
the church. This is end quote from what the Rexist party in Belgium said about Catholic action. Thus, according to this new Catholic policy, there is to be no apparent separation between Catholic action and the Nazi fascist thrust for the establishment of its new order in Europe. To the Rexist party was assigned the task of regulating the relations between the Roman Catholic Church and the fascist state in Belgium by means of a concordat, as was done in Germany through von Papen and the present Pope Pius XII, then Papal Nuncio to Germany. This new historic mission of the Church of Rome, initiated by the Lateran Pact and Concordat of 1929 between the Vatican and Fascist Italy, calls for collaboration with the Nazi fascist dictators, unhampered by any questioning of interference from the people or the lower clergy. Liberal principles and popular freedom have to be crushed out as completely in the Church as in the State. Quote, we in America are only now beginning to see clearly how the news was formed to strangle all forms of liberalism and democracy in pre-Hitler Europe in order to make way for the Nazi fascist hierarchical grouping of nations and individuals in a sort of revived Roman Empire of the German nation. And the real motivating force behind it all has been the thrust of the Jesuit counter-reformation, antedating all the dictators which aimed to crush out of existence the hated liberal principles of the Protestant democracies. It has indeed been an ungodly combination that worked together to accomplish these, this objective. Catholic reconstruction movement of Pope Pius XI, Italian fascism, Hitler's National Socialism, French anti-Semitic leagues, La Roque and uh, the Cagulards, Belgian Rexism, the Hungarian racist movement of Father Banga, White Russian Association, Croatian associations, whose hand appeared in the assassination of King Alexander of Serbia and French Foreign Minister Bartu, Slovene separatists led by the Jesuit father Anton Koroshets, who worked his way to the presidency to, uh, of the Senate in Yugoslavia, the Catholic prelates and politicians of old Austria, Monsignor Seipel, Dolfus, Schosnik, and others, the priest politicians of Slovakia, Carpatho Ukraine and Bohemia, Fathers Hlinka and Tiso, not forgetting Franco and his fascist generals in Spain, and the Laval Petain cliques in France. All of these worked closely together and were interlinked with the Roman Catholic Church in working towards the same end, the destruction of the post-Reformation structure of Europe and the world. But the end is not yet. And I'd like to add here, we still have to conquer the United States of America, and by them, the rest of the world. And you probably remember me from other broadcasts, quoting uh, from the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Daily Tribune, that is, from May 5th, 1903, a quote from Archbishop James E. Quigley, in October 5th, uh, who lived between October 1854 and July 10th, 1915, who stated in that issue of the Chicago Daily Tribune, quote, When the United States rule the world, the Catholic Church rules the world. Now, everybody knows that at least from the end of the Second World War, the United States of America have really become an empire. An empire, the second beast of Revelation 13, that gives allegiance only to the first beast, which whose wound was healed, as we just read, in the Concordat in the Lateran Treaty of 1929 with Mussolini. Since then, the Roman Catholic Church has gained more and more power, and since the United States of America are under total control of the Jesuits, they are under total control of the Roman Catholic Church. By that, 
when the United States of America rules the world, the Roman Catholic Church rules the world, and this chapter of the book ends with the sentence, but the end is not yet. No, the end is not yet. The end of the Second World War was almost there at that time, in 1942, just three years to go, but the end is not yet. The biggest fights still have to come. They extirpated probably all the Protestants in Germany, and they did the same over there in the United States of America with the ecumenical movement with Vatican II. And all the Protestants that they did not get by the ecumenical movement or the rising of the Charismatics, they will get when martial law is put upon you. Because the Roman Catholic Church seeks to destroy Protestant Christianity, Bible-believing Christianity. And the biggest bulwark today of Protestantism still left in this world is the United States of America. So even it is on the top, reigned by the Roman Catholic Church, they still have to get the people in line with the politics of the government. And whenever you're not in line with the government, well, you follow the news. I don't have to tell you what's going on over there in the United States. You know it by yourself. And the United States of America is not ruled by law, it is ruled by executive orders of Presidents George W. Bush and Obama and probably the one who comes after him, whether that be Trump or Hillary Clinton or I don't know. They're all Jesuit puppets. Now you just cry up, oh, Trump is a protestant. Yeah? Is he? First of all, the protestants are all ecumenical. That's point one. Point two... Trump has had two years of Jesuit University Fordham training. He has five children, of whom three went to Jesuit schools. Two to Penn U and one to Jesuit Georgetown University in Washington. And don't even get me started on Hillary Clinton, who you know that her husband, former President Bill Clinton, was Jesuit educated at Georgetown University and he very much held up to Carol quickly at that time. Anyway, this ends the reading of chapter 11 of Behind the Dictators and leaves us with just one chapter, chapter 12, Pro-Germanism of Pope Pius XII. That's for another video. I thank you very much for your attention, for listening and watching to the video. God bless you, and until next time, Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off. Bye-bye.